You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. At a high level, this really sets uh, our Baptiste project out as one of the best nickel projects in the world. Uh, outlines an almost 30 year mine life, uh, project MPP of uh, over US uh, $2 billion internal rate return just under 19%. Welcome back to Money Stock Education. I am your host, Bill Power, speaking today with Martin Turin, President, CEO, and Director of one of our sponsors, FPX Nickel. Martin, welcome back onto the show. And you just released uh, a study that's been years in the making. I met with you first in 2018, and here we are in 2023, and you've released a preliminary, uh, a pre-feasibility study, excuse me, a pre-feasibility study could you walk us through some of the high points of this and how does it compare to your peers? Yeah, thanks, Bill. It is a major milestone. I, I think that first investors should should recognize that a pre-feasibility study does represent a significant step up in engineering maturity and accuracy versus the PEA or the scoping study stage. And I, I don't think that that's always well understood, but it, it is a significant body of engineering that's gone into this. You know, at a high level, this really sets uh, our Baptiste project out as one of the best nickel projects in the world. Uh, outlines an almost 30 year mine life, uh, project MPP of uh, over US uh, $2 billion internal rate of return, just under 19%. And all of that, at a, uh, bearing in mind a few important things. One, the significant inflation that we've seen in our sector and in our society over the last few years is fully reflected here on the cost side impacting both ca uh, capex and opex and we're also using a very ni modest nickel price assumption at eight dollars so eight dollars 75 cents a pound some of the other pure projects that have come to market with studies recently are using 11 or 12 dollars nickel uh per pound the study really outlines those uh those strong margins uh protection throughout the volatile nickel price cycle and a project that has this unparalleled flexibility to to serve both the stainless market and the battery market. And, and so we think it really positions us head and shoulders above the competition. Martin, when I first started investing in junior mining stocks, I would try to gather as many rule of thumbs as I could. And one of the rule of thumbs that I was told is if you're going to invest in a pre-production developer, make sure they have at least a 20% internal rate of return. Uh, this comes in at 18.6. Uh, what would you say to me in light of that rule of thumb? Yeah, I think that it's a rule of thumb that maybe is applicable to sort of uh, shorter my life projects, maybe like a 10 year deep leach cold project. You'd want to use that as a pretty strong rule of thumb. But for a multi decade or even potentially multi generational asset, it's a little bit different. Those tend to come with significantly higher capex, and our project certainly does in that regard. Um, some of the other rules of thumb that we look at uh, are, are things like uh, the ratio of, of, uh, of the my life to payback, for example. Uh, that's a, that's an interesting rule of thumb that we know major companies use as a kind of initial screening tool. They typically like to see that ratio of mine life to payback being at least four or five to one. In our case, it's almost eight to one. Um, you know, long mine life projects like this also are a little bit undercut by the effects of discounting over time, right? Uh, when you discount cash flows out, you know, that are occurring 20 or 25 or 30 years out into the future, they return very little in terms of NPV, so that that reflects you know uh, a relatively low IRR versus that twenty percent bar. But if you look at some of the recent major copper copper projects that have been developed and are now in construction and closed operation by companies like Tech or Anglo American, those are typically generating IRRs in the ten to twelve percent range at best. So an IRR of almost twenty percent in our case is actually very robust, and, and I think they're you need a few more thumbs there to have a bit more rules to evaluate these projects. And how did you, you mentioned the conservative nickel price uh, input. What about the 8% uh, discount rate? How did you settle on that? Yeah, again, that's that's relatively typical, I think, for base metal projects. Uh, gold projects are still often using 5% uh, percent discount rates. I think 8% has been a standard in our in our sector for quite a long time for, for base metal projects. But even if you flex that up to 10 or 12%, you're still getting fairly robust return profile. Uh, obviously, that's important in the context of today's uh, interest rate environment. Are you still in the lowest quartile of production cost? Yeah, we are. Yeah. Uh, so the production costs on a C1 basis with no byproduct credits assumed, and that's very important because other 
projects off and try to sneak in very aggressive assumptions on byproduct credits. Uh, we, we assume no byproduct credits to generate a C1 cost of three dollars and seventy cents uh, US per pound. Uh, if you look at the current cost curve for nickel, you know average cost of nickel production currently is in the range of sort of six to seven dollars a pound on a C1 basis. So yeah, very squarely in that bottom quartile of the cost curve. Are you looking at a higher grade starter pit to begin the project? Yeah, so there, there is a phasing uh, aspect to this uh, PFS. Uh, the, the the PEA that we did in 2020 was based on a single build life of mine throughput. This has a phasing approach where we start a little bit start smaller initially, and then after we paid back initial capital, we do see that scale up. And those initial years certainly are focused on the higher grade mineralization in the southeastern part of the Baptiste deposit, where the, the nickel grades are you know, in the range of about 15% or so higher than the life of my uh, average. And, and those those grades occur near surface. And so it's an ideal place to start mining for sure. So one of the things you put in here early on in this press release was you said that this offers you unparalleled flexibility, whether you want to go high grade concentrate or refinery option. Could you dig into that a little more? Yeah, that really comes back to the fact that this is a unique style of mineralogy. You know, we're focused not on sulfite nickel or laterite nickel, but on a, on a novel form of nickel mineralization called a uh, That a mineralization has significant uh, advantages, both in terms of the ease of processing to, to recover a very clean, high-grade concentrate, but then also the huge advantages and the unique advantages this style of mineralization has for down, downstream applications. Uh, you can take that concentrate and agglomerate it into a briquette. So think like a, a charcoal briquette uh, for an old school uh, barbecue grill. And that, that briquette can go directly as, uh, as an input into the production of stainless steel in an electric arc furnace. The other advantage here is the ability to feed this into a refinery, so into a chemical process to produce battery-grade nickel sulfate or NiSO4. And that's kind of the holy grail of nickel production currently is to produce that nickel for bat in a form suitable for batteries. So this aware white mineralization, again, ease of processing, producing a very clean, high grade product. And one importantly, that doesn't need to go through a smelting stage. A lot of value gets lost in the nickel mining business because of the need to smelt nickel sulfide concentrates and the capital and operating costs associated with that to say nothing of the environmental uh, costs uh, of smelting. In our case, because of the lack of those deleterious elements in the concentrate, we can bypass that step. And that allows us to crystallize much higher revenue per ton of nickel than other competing projects. So could you, at the same time from your ore, produce for the stainless steel industry as well as the battery market at the same time? Yeah, and that, that's exactly what the refinery option in our pre-feasibility study looks at, is you would have a the bulk of production under that refinery option would go into... Uh, uh, developing the world's largest nickel sulfate refinery. So producing 40,000 tons of nickel contained uh, in nickel sulfate for batteries per year. However, the life of mine nickel production uh, or, over the course of the Baptiste project is almost 60,000 tons. So everything over and above that 40,000 tons would go into the stainless steel market under that option. And so the ability to serve both those markets and to have flexibility to scale up or scale down the production to both those markets is, is hugely strategically important. You know, in any kind of metal market, it, it's really difficult to project, you know, demand trends even 10 years, never mind 20 or 30 years down, down the track. We know that nickel is always going to be used in stainless steel. It's likely to have a role in the long term in, in uh, high nickel battery chemistries. But that flexibility to serve both those markets is really key before you want to, you're going to expand the capital to develop a, a new generation of nickel mines. The qualitative value of a pre-feasibility study in terms of what it can do for a feasibility study differs, I understand. So how much of the feasibility study work did you get accomplished within this pre-feasibility study? Yeah, I know, you know, some some companies sort of play that game saying, well, we did a pre-fees, but we really did all of these things, these aspects to a feasibility study level. I, I mean, there, there's maybe some aspects of that in our project, but we, we take a really robust, sober approach to project development. We don't get too promotional about saying our PEA project is already really at a PFS or our PFS project is really already at, at a fees. This is squarely a pre-feasibility study, but one that, as I think you can see by just the metal price assumptions 
is done with a very sober uh, and robust sort of engineering to what's to uh, engineering approach to, to what's really achievable. And it's not aspirational, I think, uh, in terms of how it models the, you know, the engineering aspects, the capital and the operating cost assumptions we feel are very fair. Uh, there was a press release that you put out uh, some weeks ago about uh, the First Nations group that you're working with. Stock sold off 30%. It's about 20% lower than what the stock was before that. How can investors be assured that this project is not derailed as a as a result? Yeah. So first, I mean, we have to acknowledge that our relationship with that particular group, which is called Clause Nation, is that, that relationship is really governed by the terms of uh, an agreement we have with them. There are confidentiality provisions in that agreement that you know, prevent us from, you know, speaking in a, in a public context to much detail with respect to those discussions we have with Clauston. Now, I would say it is a group that we have, you know, an over 10 year track record of really positive and respectful engagement with, and that we, we, we look forward to the opportunity to continue that engagement with Clause Nation, as well as the constituent KOs or, or family groups that comprise the nation. Um, we continue to envision that we'll be entering into the environmental impact assessment process in 2024. And as we advance towards that, we continue to view that that process is, is really the ideal forum or structure to, to measure the impacts uh, uh, that the project will have, to measure the, or to define the enhancements or the mitigations that can be put in place to mitigate those impacts and to fully the, to define the benefits of the project. Uh, to, the, to the local community. Um, and so we look forward to our continued collaboration with Clause Nation as well as the neighboring Indigenous groups that were, you know, uh, encouraged by the government to continue to engage with, uh, with whom we have, uh, you know, uh, equally strong and, and supportive relationship. Um, and, and as we go forward into that EA process, we, we look forward to the ability to engage with all of those groups, you know, to develop, to develop a truly modern mining project that really places the the cultural and heritage and environmental values of these nations at the forefront. Yeah, are there any comparable development projects in BC that investors could look to as maybe guidance for uh, this process you're going through? Yeah, I mean, there's a good track record of other large-scale projects in BC in just the last decade that have gone through this process. Um, you know, Mount Milligan, which is now a, a large-scale operating copper gold mine, it's located about 50 miles away from us in central BC has been a successful operator for a long time. Uh, the Blackwater Gold Project is the most recent precedent uh, that's owned by a company called Artemis Gold. And it recently received its full suite of permits and is now in the construction phase. And, and so, you know, there is an ability to to advance these projects and to get things done in BC and to, but at the same time, you know, maintaining and, and upholding those relationships with indigenous rights holders at, at, at the center of what we do as mining companies. Jogmec, uh, you have a partnership with them. They're looking to you for a wear white mineralization exploration. Is there an update you can give us on this joint venture? Yeah, there is. So Jogmec is proving to be a, a great partner for us. Uh, you know, in in June, we hired a new uh, VP of Generative Exploration, uh, Keith Patterson, who spent uh, quite a long time uh, heading up Generative Exploration for El Dorado Gold. So it comes with great pedigree. Um, and Jogmec is very keen to source new sources of nickel supply of the Japanese automotive industry. Uh, obviously, the car industry is a key part of the Japanese economy. Uh, so we, you know, we're leveraging off work that we've previously done to, um, let's say, scout the world for uh, a wear white nickel deposits. We've got our sort of shortlist targets that we're working up on a desktop basis right now, and then this fall we expect to actually get boots on the ground. In several different countries around the world to evaluate those pro prospects more fully. You know, the other thing I think that's interesting and people should be mindful of is that Jogmec is now playing a very key role in the uh, Japanese industrial strategy with respect to the critical mineral supply chain. Um, the Japanese government has allocated a significant portion of capital that's being managed by Jogmec for Japanese industry to be able to, to tap into to make investments in mineral projects. And so I'd say sort of watch this space for the opportunities that are going to be availed to FPX or companies like FPX to further and deepen our collaboration with, with uh, the Japanese government and with Japanese industry. Um, you know, that's a country, as I said, that's heavily relying on cars as part of its industrial strategy. They've been largely frozen out of the, the nickel supply growth in places like Indonesia, and they're really having to look farther field to places like Canada 
to secure those critical mineral supply chains. That's going to mean, you know, upstream investment in, into companies like FTX here, I think, in, 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 in the period to come. Martin, what do we have for upcoming Q4 catalysts for the company? Really looking forward, obviously, to getting the uh, PFS study filed. Uh, the full technical report will be available in October on CDAR and on our website. And that's going to give people a lot of detail to chew on. Um, beyond that, we're really getting into the first stages of trade-off studies for the feasibility study, as well as preparation for entering into that environmental assessment, ongoing environmental uh, and cultural baseline study work, and then preparing for an active field season in 2024 that would underpin the necessary field data that's, that's needed to complete a feasibility study, which would then kick off in late 2024 or early 2025. In addition, we still have a lot of you know exploration optionality around the van target where, as you know, we made a major discovery in 2021. We have the ability to continue to expand that discovery in field seasons to come. Um, something we don't talk a lot about is our subsidiary CO2 lock, which is focused on carbon sequestration in these unique types of geological settings. And we expect to see some, some catalysts and some loose flow on that front here in the coming weeks and months as well. And you'll be marketing the company at Beaver Creek, I would assume, the Precious Metals Conference coming up? Yeah, conference season is definitely upon us. Uh, Beaver Creek is kind of that first one, and then there's several more through the fall. So it'll be good to get out and tell investors, particularly institutional investors, about the PFS and how we think this product kind of really sits within the uh, development of the EV battery supply chain as a really fundamental piece of that supply chain in North America going forward. And for investors that don't know, we got a little less than thirty million in the treasury. If I do my own calculation, that's correct. Around thirty million Canadian in the treasury, so we're fully funded for a very active season in twenty twenty four. Really fully funded out into twenty twenty five. And as I've said in the past, Bill, I don't envision us having to do a traditional capital markets raise that involves sort of Bay Street or House Street ever again. I, I do think that our fundraising initiatives going forward will always be of a strategic nature. We've taken on two major strategic investors over the course of the last nine months, investing at, you know, in one case, a 27% premium to market, in, a, in the other case, a 40% premium to market. It, FPX represents a, a particular opportunity in the junior mining space where people buying in the open market actually have an advantage over what the eventual private placement funders will have with respect to pricing. Well, I will put a link to the pre-feasibility study press release in the show notes below. The company's website is fpxnickel.com to learn more. On the Venture Exchange, FPX is the ticker, and in the States, it's F-P-O-C-F. Martin, thank you for coming on the show and providing this update. Thanks a lot, Bill. 